I'm going to change topics and go to southern rust and some nematode issues in corn. Uh, I think most of you who have been growing corn have probably seen southern rust in your corn. It very noticeable yellow to yellow-orange pustules on the leaves, which also saw, show up on the uh, uh, corn husks. They'll show up on the stalks. Pretty much all the corn plant is sensitive to being colonized by the southern rust fungus. We do have common rust on corn, and the pustules are a little bit different color. They show up a little earlier in the season, and the disease does not move nearly as quickly uh, as southern rust does. Now, southern rust is not a, for one thing, the fungus doesn't overseason here. It's a Puccinia species. It comes in from either the Caribbean or from Mexico, probably Mexico. And we need certain types of weather patterns, particularly a frontal zone uh, with a low pressure system moving out of the Gulf, coming out of Mexico, and then coming into Alabama to bring a spore cloud uh, into this area. The other possibility would be a tropical storm. Uh, an early season tropical storm would bring, again, bring inoculum into this area. In the, the fungus is active in the winter time in Florida, where they grow sweet corn in extreme southern Florida. So, it will. There's actually a different track for that disease to move up into uh, Georgia and then into uh, uh, into the Carolinas. It's not an every year disease in this area. Uh, even down in Baldwin County, where more or less is our rust center in the state. Uh, maybe see serious problems every three to five years. Uh, if you go and look at double crop corn, which we do have some folks down along the coast will plant corn after wheat or they'll actually plant corn after corn, that's almost an every year occurrence. It'll, it'll get into that corn pretty badly, uh, that second corn crop. But normally speaking, our early corn um, really not all that often. Now, we did have a big rust outbreak in 2014. Uh, primarily down here in Baldwin, Mobile County, right along the Florida Panhandle. It showed up when the corn was starting to tassel, which is typically that window where if it shows up in that time frame, it's going to really tear the corn up pretty good. The later it shows up, the less likely it is to have an impact on yield. There was a moderate amount of rust in this zone in the lower counties. Uh, there was certainly enough in that area to treat, particularly for those growers that were growing, that, that make 250 or so bushels per acre. Uh, for regularly early corn, there was no rust in central Alabama and none in the northern part of the state. However, um, again, we had some corn planted a little bit later in these areas and the corn hit it with both feet so that delayed planting is going to be an issue. There's always a question as to how much impact this disease has on yield and uh, as I mentioned before the earlier it shows up the more likely it will have an impact on yield. This was just a test this past summer in some May planted corn and Two applications per axor, we made 150 bushels, and in the control, we made 109. So that's what, uh, 41 bushel yield decline due to rust in this particular instance. Uh, uh, Bob Kimmelwright sent me the results of a fungicide trial that he had over in Georgia. I'm not really sure of the location. And in his test, he saw a 70 bushel yield decline between the best fungicide treatments and the non-treated control. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But basically, from all indications, the earlier planting goes in, the less likely it is to have issues with rust. Now, it doesn't mean it won't show up. It just that greatly reduces the risk. We did generate some information on corn varieties, and the problem we have at this point in time is we had one gene out there in the marketplace that conferred a fairly high level of rust resistance in corn varieties. It was really only found in one line, and, and that line is no longer available. So 
when we have ideal conditions for rust, and this is ear rust leaf severity rating, it goes up to 11, which is a dead leaf at black layer. Uh, we're, at, we're having sevens and eights on all these varieties. And the, it doesn't matter whether it's a pioneer variety, decab variety, they're all sitting ducks when we had this much inoculum pressure and really ideal weather patterns uh, for disease development. This is a test that was up at Bruton, which is about 70 miles northeast uh, of Fairhope. And there was a lot less rust pressure at this location than there was in Fairhope, though again, some of the varieties had a fair amount of rust on that flag leaf. We did have one variety, it's a Pioneer Tropical Corn uh, 30F35H, and it basically had no rust on it. And it is a, the only variety that I'm aware of around here that has that RPP9 gene in it. So these other ones do not. But even there, there's some differences in the rate of disease development on some of these other lines. And I mentioned the RPP9 gene. Uh, the only variety used to have it was Pioneer 33M52. Uh, and it disappeared from the market this past year. The, if in a lot of the trials that I ran, you did see that this variety yielded a little bit less than the other 33M type variety. So there was a little bit of yield drag with that gene in it. The problem is we now have a uh, race of the rust fungus that is virulent on varieties with this gene. So it's not as good as it once was. It's now called slow rusting rather than resistance. And the problem we have, the other problem we have with corn varieties is we can't really figure out what rust races we have anymore because the corn lines are originally used to assess or identify races of southern rust have disappeared. So we just don't even have the genetic material to figure out what we've got out there in the field. There are a lot of fungicides out there. And there are more all the time being registered on corn. Uh, we don't have a lot of information, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute, on the performance of these different products. But the companies are coming out with newer chemistries now, and you're seeing a lot more products registered in corn. The timing, again, there's not a lot of information from field trials on the performance of these materials with respect to timing. I usually suggest to the growers they use a scouting program, look for symptoms, usually starting around VT and then come back with a second application if you need one. There's a grow stage, which is basically when the corn hits tassel and go ahead and hit, make the first application, follow with a second one about two weeks later. Uh, there's also some early calendar programs where we're looking at either applications maybe as early as V6 or V8 and then coming back at VT or uh, blister stage to make that second fungicide application. This year I did, was able to get in some different growth stage trials to look at what we're seeing with the timing of the products as well as their efficacy among products. If you look at ear rust severity, the controls were blasted in this test down in Fairhope. At V6, there was a little bit reduction in rust, but as we got later in the season, the rust control got a little better with a single application at VT, and then you saw even better rust control uh, with two applications, which you would expect to see. Uh, this test did have some issues with uh, nitrogen variability, but there really wasn't that much difference in the yield response, uh, whether we, as far as timing is concerned, or the number of applications. We almost got as much of a yield gain out of a treatment uh, at, uh, with the V6 as we did with the two applications later on. And there's about a 50 bushel yield decline in this particular trial with, uh, with rust. And these are the Stratego headline and headline, I'm uh, sorry, the Quilt XL were about the best treatments out there. Uh, when you're rating rust, you really look at color, and the yellower they are, the worse the rust is. And we're looking at the ear leaf, not the lower part of the plant, but that's still an indication uh, as the amount of rust pressure there is out there. 
Another test at Fairhope, there's still a lot of rust activity in this test. Uh, some V6 applications didn't get a reduction in rust, but we did with VT. And then the best treatment out there as a standard was two applications of a high rate of Paraxor, and there was virtually no rust out there at all. Uh, did get a yield boost with most of the treatments we had. Uh, I'm sorry, not here. These are actually statistically the same as the control. Here's the Paraxor at about an 80 bushel yield gain uh, in this particular location. And these are the remaining treatments in the test. Some V6 VTs and some other timings out there. The later the sprays were, the better the control and then more consistent yield gains uh, with those two spray programs as compared with the ones. There's also a difference in fungicide efficacy. Uh, just because they have a registration doesn't necessarily mean they all work the same. And George mentioned, uh, Gene mentioned that on SCAB, the same thing holds true here. The generic products in this test at Bruton, which was planted in May, did not work very well. And the yields were the same as we saw with the non-treated controls. There were a number of other treatments kind of in the middle where we got fair, not really good control, a pretty good control moderate yield gains here, and then we had four different treatments, the Paraxor, Headline Amp, Headline, and Quilt XL gave a very high level of control and very good yield gains from those treatments, about 65 bushels in this particular instance. And these are just what some of these treatments look like. Here's the control. It's burned up well up into the top of the canopy, whereas the Paraxor is nice and green. So we got a good control uh, with that treatment in Quilt XL and the Headline Amp. So you looked at the summary of the trials we had. The single applications actually did better than what I would have thought. I wouldn't think that a V6 application would have provide any control out uh, to the point of black layer, but they did slow the disease down at least enough so that yields oftentimes came up a bit. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. I'll try these again this coming year and see how they perform. But we tended to get more consistent control. And particularly if, you know, these are insurance policies. When you're buying a fungicide, you're probably better off spending a little extra money to make sure you get a little bit better control at the end of the season because you never really know what the weather's going to do at the end of the year. And fungicide choice did matter. It looks like the generics don't work very well. Uh, I know generic TEB is it's actually more expensive to buy the surfactant than it is to buy the fungicide now, but they just it just doesn't seem like it works well. So the name brands were better, and there are some of those products, hopefully we can get in another year of data, that look like they're better than some of the other ones. Talk a little about root knot and nematodes in corn. Uh, Historically, we don't think of nematodes being that big of an issue in corn here, but now we're growing high yields. Uh, and it also turns out that root knot that we see in cotton also goes to corn. And I did a rotation study down at Fairhope, I'm not Fairhope, down at Plant Breeding Unit about five to eight years ago. And one of the things that showed up was where we had corn behind cotton, it tended to stay green much later than the continuous corn plots. And it turned out we had very high levels of, levels of cotton root knot in this area and almost none here when corn was cropped behind peanuts. And this is just some of the data out of this study showing that as populations of root knot ju juveniles go up, the yield goes down. And overall in the study, it looked like we got about a 25 to 30 percent reduction uh, in yields of corn when we had very high levels of, of cotton root knot juveniles out there in this field. The other nematode that we've had some issues with is stubby root. This is down at the field crops unit at E.V. Smith. And there's a noticeable stunning of the plants, an uneven stand when we have stubby root nematode. It almost looks like it's a nitrogen deficiency or maybe a hard pan under these areas. It gives you the same type of symptom pattern. The one thing is these large nematodes feed on the root tips and you get these um, basically a witch's brooming of the, of the root tips 
into these very odd patterns, which is not what you'd expect to see with a healthy corn root system. And as I mentioned before, rotation makes a difference. This is just some of the numbers out of that study with corn after cotton, corn or peanuts. And in three or four years, we got higher yields with corn behind peanuts than either of the other two crops. And that's that root knot talking out there. There are some situations where we need more than rotation to manage these nematodes. And this is the list of nematicide treatments that we have in corn at this point in time. Two of them are seed dressings, which come on the seed. It's a custom applied treatment that you order at the time when you order seed. The other two are some old insecticide nematicides. They've probably been around for 50 years. Granular treatments put out in furrow. And in those rotation studies and some other tests, I have worked a lot with counter. And by and large, when we have nematodes present, we get a nice yield boost with counter and corn, maybe up to about 20 bushels per acre. There are some instances where we have, no, we have root knot out there, we don't get a yield response with counter. It's not 100% effective, but it tends to be pretty good. Started to look at some of the nematicide seed treatments and see how well they performed in comparison with counter. And two of these treatments, the cruiser, this is the fungicide component, the cruiser and poncho are just insecticides. They're widely used on corn. Here are your two nematicide treatments uh, as the main plots. Didn't have any effect in this test on root knot reproduction. No effect on seedling weight. Again, you're looking for that difference in growth with a, uh, with a nematicide treatment as compared with a control and no impact on yield. In this case, this is the counter treatment, which was a subplot treatment to these other uh, nematicide, the seed treatment nematicide insecticides. Didn't have any effect on re root knot reproduction, but we did get a bigger plant with the counter which translated into a 14 bushel yield gain in this particular test. This, this second test was done at Bruton, the other one was a plant breeding unit. A much higher rate of nematode reproduction here, but none of these treatments had any effect on plant growth. The counter subplot, we did get a reduction in root knot reproduction and the plants were twice the weight of the non-treated plants, so they were much bigger. And this slide illustrates that point. Here's the Evicta Duo corn down here. Here's the Evicta Duo plus counter. Those plants are much larger. Here's the uh, Poncho Votivo in the foreground. There's some nematicide treated plots in the background. You can see the difference in the plant height. And then here is the adjoining plots treated with counter. So they were much larger plants with the counter than without. This is the yield response and it was kind of odd. It was a little different than what I would have, uh, response than what I would have expected. With, on the cruiser treated corn seed, we did not get a significant yield gain with counter. Numerically it was higher but not statistically. With the Evicta Duo corn, the two yielded the same regardless of whether we had counter out there or not, which was a bit of a surprise. But with Poncho Votivo or Poncho, the yield gain was 21 bushels here and 22 bushels in this particular instance. So as I said, counter's not effective in 100% of the cases, but here at least, uh, with this particular seed treatment, we got a sizable yield gain. So overall, it looks like, and there are some other studies I've done, that the nematicide seed dressings on corn just don't seem to work. And we're not seeing a yield gain with those treatments with root knot in corn. The counter doesn't always suppress root knot reproduction, but that may be because we have a much bigger root system. But we tend to see 10 to 20 bushel yield gains out of that treatment. One of the things I haven't done, at least at this point in time, we haven't gotten corn into the 200 bushel yield area when evaluating these materials and that's something I need to get to take care of this year plus I haven't found a location with stubby root nematode where I can put in some trials. Uh, Kip Balkum's got that area right now and I need to get it away from him. 
I don't know how he's going to feel about that, but we'll see. I haven't been, I didn't get him off of it last year, let me put it that way. So if you're going to use counter, use it in fields with established root knot population. I've done some other trials with counter, and where I don't have root knot out there, I don't get a yield response from it. So specifically, it is a treatment in those fields where we have, uh, have some root knot issues. Now, if you, you know, if you got some soil insect issues, you know, then you might see a benefit from counter or mocap, but, uh, but I, haven't, I have not shown a yield bump in any of the trials that I've worked on. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, I'll be glad to answer them. Both of these, you know, we're, we're working on both the corn rust issues. Maybe it'll show up again this year like it did last year, which is good for me, bad for you. Uh, and, uh, and we're still working on the corn nematodes. And we'll have some information uh, summarizing these research trials on the, uh, on the internet by the spring or late winter. I haven't got to it yet. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. It's not labeled. It does, it does have activity. The Quilt XL is, it, the difference is you got some propiconazole in the Quilt XL, whereas in the Quadris it's just the azoxystrobin component. But the, the strobilia and fungicides do have good activity against uh, rust. It's just usually most of the formulations have a triazole in there with them, uh, or the newer products have a carboxamate type fungicide to give them a little more kick. Have you looked at Tellon? No. We're not rigged to put it out. That's the, um, uh, that's the problem we have with our equipment. And uh, uh, you'd have to have pictures about Dow Chemical to get any tell on out of them. I mean, they won't, they won't cut any loose, even for research purposes. You're gonna to have to spray it twice. It's bad. It's almost the only year I've never seen corn uh, rust on late corn was 2013. Every other year I put out late, uh, late corn, we've had a lot of rust issues and uh, two applications of you know headline amp or headline prax or they'll do a pretty good job. I Stratego yield generally does better than it showed here too, but. Uh, uh, no, I actually put it out at VT and R2. Um, I did it, I've done a couple of tests down in Bruton, and I've actually, and unfortunately, every time I keep increasing the number of fungicide applications, my yields keep going up with, with late corn. Now, how, how late are you talking about? June. Yeah, it's June. It's, it would be planted after wheat. Thank you.